type issues. We do very little of that. I think they probably did in the past before Right to Work passed. But when Right to Work passed on the ballot about 15 years ago, in Oklahoma, we're really blessed that most of the companies that are unionized or non-unionized play nice in the sandbox together. And we don't have a lot of those issues. But if you'll watch a lot of other states, there's a lot of real contentious times with union and non-union jobs. It's nice in Oklahoma. That's one thing we usually don't have to worry about. So what we do do that every other state labor department does across the nation is two things, child labor laws. So, you know, everybody except agriculture, which is exempted, we actually will do any kind of complaints if people see kids working somewhere that they're too young or over hours or those kind of things, and we will investigate those. And the other thing is our wage and hour division. If somebody's not being paid what uh, the contract says they would be paid, we will take the case on for free. Once a month, we have administrative law judges come into our department. And if you're in a wealthier position, say that you, you know, are a high executive and you don't think you're being paid, you're probably going to lawyer up personally and go to district court. But the people that we serve can't afford to do that in general. Now, we'll take any size claim, but the average claim we get paid out for people is around $1,000. But for most of the people we're doing that for that couldn't afford to lawyer up, that's the difference in keeping your car and making your mortgage payment and those types of things. And let's be honest, if you signed up to pay and get paid a certain amount, you need to be paid that. Besides that, we have kind of a unique position that we do different things than most Department of Labor. So there's not like a big consortium of labor people that meet all across the nation because we all do different things. So what we do is we keep people safe. And that's kind of a strange thing, but we do in the workplace and public uh, access places you wouldn't think about. So every elevator and escalator in the state, we check every one of them is public access at least once a year. And if any of y'all know, I overlapped, I was in the House of Representatives for 10 years before I was in the, in the Labor Department. I saw a new representative Beckett. Y'all know him, so we overlapped. So I'll tell you a story. He called me when I'd been in about a month on a Friday night or a Saturday night and said, hey, there's an old building in Milwaukee, so if anybody owns this, I hope I'm not here. And he said, the elevator's not working, y'all put a tag on it. And there's a father-daughter dance tonight, it's on the fourth or the sixth floor. I don't want all those little girls to have to walk up all those flights. Can you have somebody come out and take that tag? I said, oh, Representative Pickett. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, I'm not going to ask anybody to come out and take off a tag, because we only tag when it gets to the point where it could be dangerous to life. And I said, and number two, can you see the headline Monday? Children plummet to their death at the daddy daughter dance because of Beck Ever and Osborne. He said, never mind. <laughs> so somebody needs to check those things. And so what we do is have either we do it or there's a third parties, private sector can do that if they register with us and meet the qualifications to be an inspector. Uh, we also inspect things like hot water heaters and boilers in, in commercial buildings, large. The reason we do that, does anyone remember the Star Spencer school that exploded? There was a boiler years About ago. 30 something years People ago. People died, and somebody said in the legislature, well, who was supposed to be checking those? Well, nobody was. So we will get tasked with things like that. We'll get every one of those the same way. Either we go out and inspect, so like I went out when I first was elected and followed them around for a few weeks and went to OCCC, massive boilers, but we make sure that those things are safe for people. We also do this with asbestos abatement. We make sure that people are actually going to go into those types of jobs, that they're wearing the proper uniforms, that they're doing the kind of things they should be for safety. And so there's quite a few things like that we do. We also license uh, people like welders, alarms and locksmiths, so we do a lot of the training for those kind of things too. But one of the things that we do that most people don't know is a free service to every small business in Oklahoma. So small business, by definition of the Small Business Administration, is any business 500 or below. So we will go out and do free safety consultation services and help them implement plans to keep their employees safe. And because we do that, we have one of the lowest rates in the nation of people being injured on the job in Oklahoma. And as you all know, our stats are usually not that good. We're talking a lot about being a top 10 state, but in general, we're usually 45th or 50th in most indicators. This is something we're doing right. So if you're a Boeing or a Door Dam or one of these big aerospace companies, you can afford a full-time safety consultant. And they make sure they're keeping their employees safe. If you're a trailer manufacturer, a chicken shed with 25 people, you probably can't. 
What we will do, it's free and it is uh, confidential. We will come out, we'll do the walkthrough with professionals that have these, these OSHA type requirements. And if you sign up for our services, we will actually come out be embedded in the company and do all the things they get to do proper venting make sure we're doing that and, and exit signs and lanes where people can't be heard and you have shields on different equipment all those types of things now the benefit is the lives you're going to keep your employees safe the second one is if you do go through this and get our certifications and renew it every year by staying safe your, your workers compensation insurance is going to be much cheaper so it's really a win-win for businesses and most people don't realize we do that we also do it in oklahoma we're one of only seven states that are allowed to do it for the public sector so we go out and do the same thing for cities and counties and schools and uh, it's just something that you know we try to really go out for instance um, in Mangum, about six months ago, a city worker was electrocuted. Did something that backed up and hit a high power line. Well, Mangum's a small town. If you live in Edmonds, you can have a full time safe So we immediately reached out and said, we need to be doing training for these small towns. And we work with municipal aid and counties and schools to go out and do those kind of things to try to keep us safe. Um, and now that I've told you every exciting thing that the Department of Labor does, I thought I'd also just talk about a little bit where we are as a state. This is a lot better than it's been in the last few years. There's a real positive attitude in the capital. My friend Misty Paxi came with me, her husband serves in the Senate. Um, but as you all know, the last three or four years before this year were very difficult. We had some horrendous budget times and uh, cuts to our schools, cuts to state services, things that were very difficult. Uh, I'm not known for my timing because I was the budget chair for the House of Representatives the year we had the worst budget crisis, crisis in state history. And we had a $1.2 billion shortfall. The year before, $850 million. The year before, $600 million. And everybody will ask them, how did we ever get in that mess? And how do we make sure we don't do it again? Because it really matters. Now in D.C., when they cut taxes and do these different things, they deficit spend. They keep spending on all the same things, but the deficit gets bigger. How much we owe to everybody that we're taking out. In Oklahoma, we're a balanced budget state. So we can't do that. We can never spend more than we take in. So on the bad years, we have to make the cuts to agencies, which means that we're actually making cuts to services for people across the state. But a lot of people don't realize that. So I, the year I came in, and it was so horrifying. And um, you know those pictures they show of presidents like the year they were elected and four years later? My hair is solid gray now. <laughs> and this is an honest story. Like, I would get to work at 8 in the morning, and one of my male colleagues, because almost everybody at the Capitol is male, would say, God, do you feel well today? So I just said, God, you don't tell me that. Uh, no wonder I'm single. So, but I carefully dye my hair in this lovely blonde every six weeks because appearance is bliss. We don't know it's under there. But I told the speaker that I was going to find out how we got this mess. So for six months, which was the interim before we went back in session, I dug through tax records. I went through to an economist and talked about what were the recessionary trends, what were the oil and gas markets doing. How the heck did we get in this mess? And it became very apparent there were three reasons. Number one was out of our control. During that time, we had the worst crisis in state history in oil and gas. We're very dependent on oil and gas in the state, and it's when I ran, and right now we're starting to see some of those things with I ran again, was dumping around 400 million barrels of oil a day on the black markets. That was affecting our prices hugely, rigs shutting down, oil companies laying people off, it affects our economy, guys, hugely. But that was only one third of it. The second third was we cut taxes too many times. So, in Oklahoma, we had, before I came into the legislature, an income tax rate of 7%. We cut it eight times over a 10-year period. And we did it in little increments from 7 to 6.75. And then two years later, 6.5. And we just kept going down, but we weren't finding the store. Because everything we do at the legislature and the Capitol seems to be in the increments of when people get elected to office. So you might have somebody that's like your chief financial officer, but he turns out, and then you bring in somebody new who's not really sure why they do this, and there's just never continuity. So when you looked back at it in history, the first four times worked, and that's what they call supply-side economics. 
So say I wanted to cut your taxes a quarter percent. I would go to the tax commission and say, how much did a quarter percent bring in last year? They might say 50 million. If I can show that the next year after we cut it, we brought in more than 50 million more in revenue, and there's always going to be a few indicators that change things. In general, you would say it worked, and here's why. They'd say people kept more of their own money. They hired more people. They paid better wages. They bought more equipment for their companies, and the economy flourished. Okay? The first four times we did it to 6%, that happened. Then we go to 575. We get the opposite effect. We start bringing in less revenue. It's not working anymore. We reached a saturation point. And then what did we do? We cut it again to 5.5, five, and we cut it again to 5.25. Five. And guess who ran the bill to run it the last time to 5? Because I was this little freshman representative from Tuttle, Oklahoma, and it sounded good. And they said, we need you to run this. I didn't know what to do it. But I was a damn good marketer. And I got it sold. So I can stand here as somebody who actually was part of the problem and then stood up and said, guys, we did this to ourselves. We had to fix it. Own the mistake and fix it. So then we had also cut gross production tax on oil and gas companies from seven to two. Nine tax cuts that were just taking us down into here. The third and last thing, and this may be more economics than you want to know, but please remember these things because you will elect people again that will talk about wanting to do some of these things again. And it'll kill us. Is we had two well meaning representatives who ran bills that cost huge amounts of money off the top which means we don't get to decide at the legislature anymore. One was that our teacher's retirement system was going bankrupt. And it was. We had a horrible problem. And we were $16 billion unfunded on our liability of our public pensions. That's a problem. If they're not 80% actuarially funded, got some fiscal numbers here for you, they're not sound. You can't do colas, you can't do those kind of things. Teachers were down to about 45%, in danger of eventually going bankrupt. Why were teachers worse? Because Misty knows most teachers are nice, clean living ladies. They go to church three times a week and they're not out crazy like politicians because ours aren't doing as bad because we died in much younger, right? Uh, so that being said, they were in trouble. He said, let's take $300 million a year off the top and we'll fix it. Well, we fixed it. It's already up to 72%, but who was going to pay for that $300 million? He didn't give us a revenue source. He just told us it was going to work. Okay, well, we all voted for it. It sounded beautiful. That's $300 million of services the state didn't get anymore, but we fixed a problem. Never pass a bill that fixes a problem that takes money without a dedicated revenue source to fix it. Okay, we wouldn't do that in our own home budget. Second was the roads fund and the eight year plan. So in the old days, whatever politician that was in power was in the capital, their district had the best roads in the state because they made sure they had to pet projects. This was not a good way to do this. So we said, we're going to come up with the eight-year plan. Gary Ridley, the most fantastic uh, person we ever had running transportation, but we would have to fund this better, and no road or bridge would be built in this state if it wasn't done because it had the highest rates of uh, accidents and the most fatalities and, and the heavily traveled uh, routes. So it was a great thing. But the first year was going to cost $100 million, and it was going to cap out at $850 million off the top so we didn't get to vote on it every year. The year that I was budget chair, it reached the 8 Where does that 850 come from? Your schools, your hospitals, your everything else. Never pass something you're not putting the money in to pay for. We wouldn't do that in our own budgets. So those three things caused a tempest that was just out of control. That being said, we all started publicizing this. I stood up on every rooftop about how I'm a Republican, but I'm telling you, if we don't raise taxes, we're going to bleed out. We're 50th in the nation. <coughs> we can't keep our schools. Our teachers in the schools, we're not recruiting and retaining the best and the brightest. Our rural health care is dying. Foster kids are going to die in their homes tonight because we don't have enough workers, because mom's boyfriend's going to beat a child to death. Shame on us. The speaker fired me because I was a loud woman that was talking too much about things that uh, he didn't want to hear because that made me a bad Republican. That being said, I would do it all over again because it started the ball rolling, and the next year they passed what was called the biggest tax increase in state history. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is if you ask a far-right Republican right now, what are your taxes? Because we, they publicized so much that we passed the biggest increase in state history, I think most of them said 14th or 15th. 
Guys, we're 45th in the nation now in overall tax collections. That is not too high. If you want, now here's a philosophical question for you. Can you be a top 10 state if you're 45th in overall tax collections? Just a philosophical question. I'm not advocating for raising taxes, but I'm just making sure as hell can if you're 50th. Because you're not paying your teachers because rural health care is dying, because you're not paying enough Medicaid rates for your nursing homes to stay open, because your roads and bridges are structurally unsound, people don't want to move their businesses here, they don't want to keep their businesses here. Our best and brightest kids and grades will graduate from college and say, I don't want to stay in Oklahoma. That is not what we want. Now, because we've made some of those difficult decisions, and remember, just the 45th, what have we been able to do for educators? And I believe is 7,300, Misty, that we've done in the last two years. 7,300, and it's making a difference. There's a great editorial in today's Tulsa World, pull it up, that talked about the rates of hiring and keeping the best and brightest in starting to work. We put more dollars into the classroom in the last two years. Part of this year's budget bill ensures that nobody in a kindergarten or first grade class will have more than, I think, 20 in a classroom. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the four and that five day school weeks. Uh, but we still have a lot of work to do. Our roads and bridges, because of those decisions that were made, maybe not wise in a financial manner, we had, when that bill passed, I believe uh, 1,300 structurally deficient bridges were down to 112, I think is what the last number I saw was. In the next 18 months, we're supposed to have zero structurally deficient bridges. These are the type that you drive under and chunks of concrete are coming through and will collapse when a school bus is driving over. We don't need those kinds of things. You have to pay for some of these things. And the one thing I will talk to you about that we are missing the football on and we really need to be doing is justice reinvestment. So I had never even heard of criminal justice reform until about my third year in the legislature. And everybody started talking about how we had the highest incarceration rate in the nation for men. Now we do for women as well. I'm still not sure that like North Korea is really reporting, so I'm sure that they say <laughs> some of these numbers, it's a little bit, at least in the United States, we do. That being said, do we have the worst people? Absolutely not. But what we do have is some pretty tough laws and a lot of people that grew up in poverty but have a different path. How do you change that? We're starting one side, but we haven't been doing the other. The first side is to change some of your laws. So on the state ballot two years ago, many of y'all probably remember, we had state question 7 8. It took 60 convictions in Oklahoma that were felonies for drug offenses that were nonviolent. Overnight, we changed it where all 60 of those became misdemeanors. So anybody that committed that crime going forward would only have a misdemeanor, not a felony, would change a lot on who went to jail or not. But we didn't do anything about the people that were already adjudicated in the system. Now, this year, Governor Stitt just signed a bill that went through the House and the Senate that will actually let those people that are already in for the crimes that we changed it on release early. That bill will go into effect in November, so by the end of the year, we may have a large floodgate coming out of a lot of prisons of people that wouldn't have gone. Some of the district attorney's councils were not happy about this. And one thing you, you always have to remember, there's always a little caveat. Some of the people were sentenced for things that they pled down other things. So it's a little iffy how you do that, but we signed it. The governor did sign it. But here's the problem. We have patterned justice, criminal justice reform after Texas, who did this very successfully. <laughs> Texas had the highest incarceration rate in the nation about 20 years ago. And they passed this, but the same day they passed it, they put $250 million of new money into a fund. And every district you can every district attorney in every county of Texas required everybody that would have gone to jail or got out early to have substance abuse counseling, mental health counseling, GED attainment, and job training to change their path. In Oklahoma, we're doing it with no funding because we're assuming they all found Jesus in jail and they're going to go back to their nuclear family who's going to pay for their four-year degree. I know it's a marriage like you getting elected. My consultant tells me that all the time because I'm painfully honest. Guys, it's not going to work. A few of them did find Jesus in jail. Thank you, and I do go to church every Sunday. Don't think I'm being facetious. It takes more than that. And a few of them do have, a few 
have a network to go back to that will house, that will feed them, and educate them. But here's what the vast majority of them are. They were sexually abused growing up, physically abused, mentally abused. They do not have a nuclear family that will pay for and, and fund their change. They will go back to the same people they knew before because that's what we all do. Why the hell would we think anything's going to change except free events? So think about this one person that we fix for a dollar. They get out of jail, and we start intensive therapies. We get them clean. We figure out the root problems. We actually help them get a degree for a trade or something where they can get a job. It costs us a dollar, okay? And here's what we do if we don't spend that dollar. Okay, we're going to get out, we're going to commit the next crime, and then we're going to have a baby out of wedlock, and then we're going to be in Section 8 housing, and then we're going to be on food stamps. Second baby, two taken by the DHS system, higher crime, incarcerated this time, families now raising a fourth kid. Let me go on. $20. It's called investment. That doesn't make me a bleeding heart. That doesn't make me a bad Republican. That makes me a good Oklahoma. That's how you change Oklahoma, is you change to fund the trajectory. We don't have enough nonprofits and churches to do that for us. Thank God we have what we do. But if we don't do something to change the path, and believe me, this is generational, nothing will ever change in Oklahoma. So when you talk to your reps and senators, hello, Fat and Thompson, one of them, tell them next year you want some funding in the budget to change the path. We did $10 million this year. That was the first time in all these years of criminal justice reform we did anything. But it's not enough. It was a start. It's a penny and a drop in the bucket, but it's better than nothing. We put $200 million extra in savings for a rainy day. You can save yourself to prostitute to poverty. My point is, we have to build those savings back. The rainy day fund is back to a billion with a B because the economy's doing well, the tax dollars are coming in, we're doing well, right? But just to keep saving when you're not doing anything to invest in what changes your future, and when you invest, don't go back all the agencies. The average agency in Oklahoma was cut 45% in the last decade. Don't go back to the Department of Ag, the Department of Labor. We're lean, mean, and we're doing it. But you put it in rural health care access, you put it in mental health spending, you put it in schools and teacher salaries, and you put it in these types of things like criminal justice, then you can really consider moving up the trajectory to be a top 10 state. I just want us to all keep people accountable about how the real world works. And when you hear somebody start talking about how we got to start cutting taxes again, please run flee from these people. They don't understand how it really works. So, if anybody you know has a small business, that could potentially, like our free services, I've got some flyers here I'm going to leave with you, and it may not be you, but you may know some small business that has people that do some kind of manufacturing. We would love to help them. Uh, it can keep the doors open. It can keep jobs available. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you for letting me come speak to you today. One of the things you said, when, <coughs> the number one thing, you said gross production tax dropped to 2%. That was only for horizontal drilling. Those of us involved in vertical drilling paid 7%. Yes, always yes. paid 7%. Some of, all, some of those things, getting GPD, getting some kind of drug treatment, or shouldn't some of that happen in prison when they're in a controlled, Absolutely. That's they're in a controlled environment? Where they're, that's where I'm talking about doing it what Either, you're talking about after the Either one. Joe Hollenbaugh has been our director of corrections. He was fired last week. Don't kid yourself. Every one of these directors that's retiring is being fired. And that's fine. New administration. But Joe Hollenbaugh for years has been begging for dollars to do all of those things. And we wouldn't give him a dime because we were so broke. And we didn't see any value in doing that. So absolutely be doing it. What he wanted to do was if he saw that anybody was within 18 years to 18 months to two years of their prison sentence, he wanted to really push the trace. He even went out to his local prisons working with local career tech boards and had programming brought in for free. The Granite Reformatory had the local career tech doing plumbing classes and electrical. That's fabulous. It was only a miracle because he couldn't pay for it that they, out of the goodness of their heart, were doing it in, on their free time. But my point is, absolutely do that through the Department of Corrections. That's who you would do it through. Okay. They ran the district. Major, just a quick question. You just mentioned about uh, the uh, uh, 
if I get a license to be a plumber or an electrician to buy the development? Okay, so you well, there was a problem with that until this year, and uh, I'm in charge. I am the I am the uh, head of the board of the Occupational Licensure Advisory Commission. We look at all the licenses in the state every four years and determine if the criteria is too high to be one of these, or the fees are too high, or are we doing enough to protect the public safety? There's a reason we have licenses. So you don't want somebody that had 17 breaking and enterings getting your locksmith license and coming to your home. <laughs> so there are reason for somebody that just got out through this and probably doesn't need to own a title company within a year. But if somebody had a DUI 17 years ago, I don't mind if they cut my hair. We all need to use some common sense and find it in the middle. So a bill passed this year by Representative Zach Taylor of Seminole that said if any license in the state was being too prohibitive on a past felony, that was not related to the field or sexual in nature or violent, that couldn't be held against you anymore. That would be signed into law. It was already signed into law, but it will take effect in November. So every licensing entity in the state has to rewrite their rules. So, for instance, we do uh, learn the locksmith. We are going to change our rule now where we can't look at any felony you ever had unless violent, sexual in nature, or had to do with that. So for us, that would be something like armed robbery or breaking and entering. But if you had DUI, if you embezzled, if you were a check fighter, if whatever you stole a car 22 years ago, that will not matter anymore because we were also doing that in hopes of two things. We have a shortage of a lot of the trades, more than high school degrees. We need to be utilizing our career tech system. And we also wanted to help with justice reinvestment with people getting out and hopefully with some of the nonprofits doing some of this work, find the ones where you could get into and, and make it easier to get a job. And I, I found that any, uh, uh, if you're doing the April shaping, if you will, people, uh, many of them can't do the job. Right. And uh, that doesn't, doesn't meet the needs. However, they can create their own business, but they can't get a license right. to operate their business. Well, so I'm glad to hear that. This, yes, oh. as, of, as of November 1st this year, the rules changed in Oklahoma on that. There was also one other portion in that bill, and it was called about uh, moral turpitude. So a lot of boards have put in, as long as you've never had a felony or done anything that was uh, against moral turpitude. Well, nobody even knows what moral turpitude means. They were probably trying to say on violent or sexual nature, but this way you have to list out and it has to be in the venue of what you are doing. If it's a foster care worker, we're obviously not going to have anybody that ever did anything sexual in nature or violent in nature, but the same way. I'm not going to hold it against you if you had a joint in your pocket 18 years ago at a state sponsor. I don't remember who's face is. But anyway, anyone else? I think I sat next to you. <laughs> No. <laughs> you guys realize 